Okay. So we're going to uh, get started on MongoDB today. Last week we uh, learned about uh, the differences between, a little bit about the differences between MongoDB and SQL databases, and we uh, sort of went over data modeling and what. This week, uh, today specifically, we're going to uh, talk about MongoDB itself, the database system itself. We're going to make sure we get, have it installed on our computers and that we can successfully run it and connect to it. And then we're going to learn about interacting with the database through their command line um, application. Uh, if you've ever used SQL before, you know that you start a SQL server and then you connect to it through a SQL client. Same thing. We're going to start a Mongo database server, connect to it through a Mongo database client, and interact with it directly so that we understand how to do the uh, four CRUD operations on the database, create, retrieve, update, and delete. And then on Wednesday, we will learn how to integrate Mongo into our web application. So we're going to connect our JavaScript code to the Mongo database and actually start to persist blog posts uh, and start to show those in the application so that uh, it's more than just hard-coded data. Um, and that will be pretty exciting. That's sort of a pivotal point where it's like, OK, we've been learning some front-end stuff like HTML and CSS. We've been learning the server-side stuff. Now we're learning the database stuff. Let's, again, get it all connected. So, so it's one of those connection uh, pieces. All of the material is, of course, available on GitHub at our OK Coder site. I am going over a lesson from intro to Mongo MD file. Um, so it's all right there, right? First thing that we want to do is get MongoDB installed. If you are on a Mac, uh, and let, let's do this right now if we don't already have it installed. If you're on a Mac and uh, you've got Homebrew installed, you can fire up your terminal. And uh, do a you know brew update and then brew install MongoDB, um, and so those instructions are available on the site. It's really straightforward. If you're not on a Mac, if you're on Linux, you'll need to use apt-get. So Brent, I'm thinking about you. Um, I don't have the instructions to those in particular, but I think I linked to them. They're all available on Mongo's homepage. So uh, by the way, MongoDB's homepage is mongodb.org. The installation instructions are from there. They're part of those documents, but whether you're on a Mac, uh, a Windows computer, or a Linux, you can download a binary installation. So it'll give you a package for whatever OS you're on. We'll click that to install. Um, so let's assume that you've done that um, on a Mac. You should still have access to starting the program the same way. On Linux, you should still have access to starting the program the same way. On Windows, things will be a little bit different. And so I'm going to uh, switch over here to my Windows edition and download MongoDB. If I can, my Windows always behaves rather unhappily at me. Why would we do the brew from the uh, terminal? Yeah, from the terminal. Why? Uh, it's a command line application. Um, if we download it that way... Oh, you wouldn't need to do it. Yeah, if you download it directly, then you're okay. So probably Windows is not going to work for me. If you're using Windows 7, there's a hotfix. <laughs> Because it will crash. Downloads. There we go. So it's just it's really slow because of some hard drive issues I've got. So I'll grab it for Windows. Um, no, I just want to download it. I guess it's downloading it. So it'll take a second. You'll double click to install, and then it should put it in your program file directory. And the issue that we're going to run into is we need to start up the application from the terminal. I'm, I'm probably just going to give up on this. It just does not work properly on my system. Screw it. So you'll have to grab it from your program files, uh, and um, uh, you'll you'll so it'll be in your C program files, window, uh, MongoDB, whatever, 2.6 regular, or however it was. Standard. Standard, and you'll go into a bin directory. I like it when he was laughing at me over there. <laughs> I was laughing at Windows. I don't think it's, I'm not going to blame Windows directly. I think it's because my VM environment is set up to use it on an external hard drive. It just doesn't like that. Um, although I am happy to blame it on Windows directly as well. Uh, so go in there, go into the bin folder, and then you'll see, two, you'll see the executables that we need. Um, let's see, maybe it's going to work. It might work. I, just, I don't know why it hiccups like that. 
it's like we get there and then it freaks out again. Nope, so close, it's so close. So far, I know. Okay. Uh, open. Just gonna do it. Maybe not. Uh, who's got so on Windows? Are you guys getting? Are you finding where this is okay? Do you find that bin directory? Yeah. You'll see that there are there are going to be two program files that I'm going to refer to uh, from the Mac uh, uh, example. MongoD, and so it'll be MongoD.exe, and then uh, Mongo.exe, or just Mongo. And that's the Mongo database daemon, and then uh, Mongo itself, the client. I'm sorry, not Mongo itself, but the client application. Um, and as we're going to see, starting Mongo, we need to uh, run the daemon. It'll run itself in its own terminal, and then you run the client <laughs> to connect to it. So you have to run, run both of those. But those will be the exe files that you're interested in. And I'm just going to kill Windows. If it doesn't freak out my whole computer. All right. So, on the Mac, everybody got Mongo installed? On yes. um, Linux, everybody got Mongo installed? Let's confirm that. You should be able to type mongod at the command line like that. So mongo with a D at the end of it, and it should run but give you an error. Or you should just be able to file up that or fire up that executable, um, and it'll open up a uh, mongo with a D. Um, it'll open up a new terminal or command prompt, I suppose, and give you an error. That's what it should look like. That's okay. But that at least tells us that it's installed. The error is simple enough. Everybody got that? On Windows, does it do that? Does it fire up a little command prompt and then give you that error? Yeah? Okay, good. So, um, All right, so MongoDB is this, uh, is this uh, in a class of database systems called NoSQL databases. We touched very briefly on the difference between SQL uh, systems and uh, not SQL systems or not only SQL systems or NoSQL systems. Um, SQL systems... Per language, that's what SQL means, for accessing the database. So it's another programming language, a declarative programming language that you would need to learn, um, which is okay. Uh, in fact, SQL is still very much a standard in database systems um, and still very useful. Uh, I think uh, really the, one of the main reasons that we're using MongoDB instead of SQL is because MongoDB querying is accomplished in JavaScript. So we get to use JavaScript for our server programming. We get to use JavaScript for querying the database. And if you were doing more client-side development, you would get to use JavaScript for the client-side development. So this is called full-stack JavaScript development. And it is a, a huge benefit when you only have 10 weeks to uh, learn web application development. So we stick with really one programming language. MongoDB forms uh, part of what is known as the mean stack, which is uh, MongoDB, Express, Angular, and Node. We've learned what Node is, server-side programming in JavaScript. We've learned what Express is. It's sort of for web application development in JavaScript. We're learning what MongoDB is today. What we haven't touched on is Angular, which is a client-side framework for web development. And this forms part of a standard set of libraries and frameworks and systems that people like to do uh, web application development in when they're using JavaScript. So by the time that we finish this class, we're going to have like three or four of these, which is pretty awesome. So. Okay, um, I pointed you at the MongoDB uh, homepage, so we want to make sure we're getting mongodb.org. Their .com site is for uh, their enterprise software and support. And then um, they have documentation, docs right here. The documentation for MongoDB is excellent, um, worth going through, like how do you install everything you need to install. What about CRUD operations? This is all the material that we're going to be talking about today, so it's an excellent reference point. Uh, check it out when you have questions. So, At some point, as requested, I will put together a list of literature that I have used in the past for working on uh, 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 learning these skills, learning these systems. But one in particular that I want to mention right now is called Seven Databases in Seven Weeks from the Pragmatic Bookshelf. It's a series in addition to being a nice particular book that introduces you to seven database systems um, one week at a time. So whether you do all seven of them or go one week at a time or uh, whatnot, if this page loads, uh, my whole computer is so unhappy at me. There we go. 
seven databases in seven uh, seven weeks. They cover Postgres, which is a contemporary SQL system, and then they cover uh, MongoDB as well, as well as Couch, which are two document-based databases uh, that both use JavaScript, as well as some other uh, uh, systems that are pretty neat. So I can't remember if they do Redis or Memcache, but they do a key value store. So pretty great book. Um, and if you're into learning about databases and data modeling, this would be worth checking out. So. OK. Uh, we need to start up MongoDB. Um, in order to run MongoDB, we need to provide a data, uh, directory where it's going to store its data at. That's why you get that error uh, when the application starts the first time. On Windows, you're going to do this. Different. Uh, Windows has a uh, standard place for where it wants to store, or Mongo has a standard place for where it wants to store to its data. So fire up a command prompt in Windows. Do not run the terminal that we've been using, so not the GitHub terminal. Uh, actual Windows command prompt, which you can access from the start menu or the Windows 8 start screen by just typing in command or prompt, it should show up. And run this command, md backslash data backslash db. That is where Mongo will expect to find its database uh, uh, directory. Where you are, what your current directory is? No, because you're preceding this with a forward slash, which tells it from the root directory. Okay. So I'm with a backslash, excuse me. But again, make sure you're doing this from the command prompt and not from Git's, uh, Git's terminal. What if you did accidentally do that? Did you just fix it out? Uh, if you're in. Well, exit it. You all need to do this on <laughs> oh, Mac, though, so if that's what you're running to. Is it backslash, backslash. MD is for a make directory, right? And then backslash data, backslash DB. That guy right there. Folks, get that on Windows, okay? Did you do brief? Okay. Uh, no, it it and then, so on the Mac, you should be able to do Mongo. Uh, so, if you want to find an uh, on Mac or Linux, I'm sorry, find a new uh, folder, create a new folder somewhere. That can be anywhere you want. So, I'm just going to go put it in my Documents directory, and then again in OK Coders. Um, in 15 less, I'm going to make dir. DB. So I'm just making, in a, in a folder somewhere on my computer, I'm making a directory, and I'm calling it DB. And then when I run MongoD, the MongoD. Uh, is it? Yeah, it could be. You could do brew search. <laughs> So uh, when we run MongoD on Mac or Linux, we will pass the DB path argument to it. So two dashes DB path, and then give it that DB directory that we just created. And so we're telling MongoDB to use the DB directory that we just made to store Windows. When you double click that MongoD.exe file, it will automatically use that data DB directory uh, that you created. Is that clear? Um, that guy blew up there. Error. Mm, oh, I'm running. Uh, I'm running the daemon somewhere else. So on Windows, did you make that directory backslash data backslash cv? Just on. So let's care. Let's take care of Windows first. Run mongod.exe. If you're on Windows, just double click it. Does it work? Yeah. And it so it should just be sitting there. It gave a bunch of terminal messages, and now it's just waiting for stuff, right? Perfect. In the directory you created? No, you don't need to worry about that. Uh, just so find mongod.exe in your in your Windows Explorer. So where it was you before. Some, once you, I think it puts in something called install. Just in my C directory. Search for Mongo it should show up. Um, yeah, I just put in C. I think it's this Visual C++ uh, 2008 redistributed. How did we get to it before? No, that's not what I want. I was searching the internet. It has to be there. 
you just have for Windows Explorer, like go to your C program. Oh, that's kind of great. I don't even know how to do it all. Can I do it from like Explorer? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, perfect. Uh, so go. Seven? Oh. Yeah, eight. No. Eight. Oh, eight. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we have to, it in the program yeah, files. Yeah, go to C. And then I have it. Program files. Mongo is in there, yeah. Two point six. Then run Mongo D T dot exe. Uh, allow access. If you're on Windows and it asks you about the firewall, naturally allow access. And should have everybody on Windows got this working? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So and the reason it's not we get do we get a no? Okay, yeah, I'm Yes, that's right. Okay, no, okay. That's okay. As long if, if as long as it just doesn't if it starts up and then stops, like and you get back a command prompt or it closes, then something went wrong. If it's just sitting there waiting, that's exactly what we want. So bingo. All right. So on a Mac and a piece on a Mac and a Linux system, you're gonna type Mongo D and it should spit out a whole bunch of stuff. And say waiting for connections on port 27017. That should be the, probably the last thing that you see, and that means the date. That, so that means the database daemon is running. So what's going on here? Using a database involves two applications: the server application and the client application. The server is the database implementation. It's a thing that's just going to run in the background on your system and actually speak to your file system. Um, so actually store data somewhere, right? The client is just an interface for you to send commands to the database server. Uh, and so in SQL, you would start up your SQL server, and then you'd run your SQL client, and you'd say select star from whatever, right? With MongoDB, we run this MongoD file, our application. It starts up the Mongo server in the back uh, background, and then in another terminal window, or on Windows by just double-clicking on mongo.exe, uh, we then run the client application, which will automatically connect to the database and let us start to interact with it. And the client application functions as a REPL, a read value print loop. So it'll read in the commands that we give it, send them to the database server. The database server will execute them. Any output that results, like getting uh, an operation or getting entries back or whatever, will get sent to the client, and the client will spit that back out on our console. Right? On a Mac, you warning, soft, our limit's too low, number of files is 256, should be at least 1,000. That's very easy to fix. You can quit the server. Don't quit it on Windows. On a Mac, you can quit the server with Control-C. It's probably similar on Windows, Control-C or Control-Z, but you don't need to. Let's fix that error. You can type, I was to look this one up, ulimit dash in, and I've got 2048 here, but 1024 is probably good enough. We'll do 2048, so ulimit dash in, 2048. I can't remember exactly what that fixes. I looked it up and forgot. But now when we run MongoD, we don't get that. Oh, I have to specify the DB path. We won't get that error anymore, or that warning. And remember, when you start up MongoD, you run it with dash dash DB path and give us a path you want to use. This is a little annoying. This operation stuff is always a little frustrating, but uh, it's necessary if we want to actually do the programming. So what was the path after MongoD? Make sure you create that DB folder wherever you're at. So. Just one more. No, why do that to you? In no. Okay. So if you're in Windows, it's, you should be OK. Oh. I think it's now brushing. I don't think you need it. Because like, I ran it in, every, in Mongo and everything it worked. 
option. D, well, it's got to be D, B, D. You got D hat. You did create that uh, DB directory, though, right? Um, you can do an LS. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do, a, yeah. do an LS. Uh, no, make dir DB. OK. Um, now MongoD. Uh, no, but MongoD not by itself. Space. Mongo D, and then dash dash db db path. There you go. Nope, one word. And then db space db. Uh, db. I think Mongo D first. I'm there, you sure the D. there you go. So yeah, so, you know, so, so now it's just chilling there. And I will just stay. Okay. And now, now run Mongo. Yeah. <laughs> Frustrating, right? That's okay. You know, welcome yeah, to the world of trial and error and programming. Day. What's you like the first day again? Well, I, and I forgot that I didn't that this was not part of the setup when we uh, first started doing this class. You remember how as you guys install Node and install uh, uh, the command line and you know make sure all that stuff was working? I postponed doing MongoDB for some reason. I'm not sure why, because uh, we were going to use MongoDB from the beginning. But that's okay. So we now have our server running, right? So let's start up the client. We need another terminal to do that. On Windows, you can just double click that mongo.exe file, and that will give you a client inside of the terminal. On a Mac or a Linux, we need to fire up another terminal instance. I can split my screen if I'm on um, iTerm like that. I'll make it a little bit bigger. And all we have to do is run Mongo, so Mongo without a D on the end of it. And that is our Mongo client. And notice what happens in my other terminal here, stuff gets spit out. So it's like, hey, somebody just connected. So this is like, uh, it's logging information to the console every time something happens. And now over here, I'm actually running my Mongo client, which gives me an interface to the database. And on Windows, I suppose it just sticks it up in a new terminal or a new command prompt, and you should have access to it, right? And importantly, you should see this guy here. So that angle uh, bracket, that angle symbol means we're db repl, right? If I control C out of this or if I exit out of this, I get back my uh, dollar sign, which means I'm in bash. So I can start up Mongo again, and I'm connected to Mongo, and I get this prompt. That means anything I type is now going to Mongo, similar to being inside of Node, right? When we're inside of Node, we type JavaScript. When we're inside of Mongo, we type Mongo commands. So, Yes? For Windows, sorry, I was trying to get it to work on my machine. Um, are we supposed to make another... Directory. Yes. So you'll fire up a command prompt, and you want the directory, the this guy right here. So you can fire up a command prompt and type this command: md for make directory. Everything we do in Mongo is working in that database. That's working right. Not in, but in that folder. We'll be in that folder. Okay. That's right. All right. And on the Mac, we are specifying which folder we want it to use with that DB path argument. So. So we don't need to do anything else in these console. No. These command, these command buttons. No, uh, except for the client one. So you, when you start up Mongo, everything we do is going to be inside of that that uh, that command prompt. Okay. Right. So. You got that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if there's one, you want my way in case there's one last question, maybe memorize that so that we get Mongo the uh, <laughs> Mongo DB started up on Windows. Sure. All right, it'll be easier. Turns out that turns out that Mon- once we get this stuff started, Mongo itself is really easy to use. So it'll get easier, I promise. Let's see. Okay, this is our REPL for using Mongo. So we are going to type commands into this, and like I said, they're going to get sent to the database, executed, and we're going to get the output of those commands. Uh, we can get information directly from the REPL by typing the help command. So this is a lot like Node. Really, we're just going to type into this thing, and we're going to get information back. At any point, you can type help, and you will get a list of things that you can do in the REPL given. And so it's like these are all the commands that we could type right now. db.help with a parenthesis, help admin, help connect, help misses, show dbs, and so on. This is everything that we can do right now in the REPL. So just as an example, let's do a show dbs. 
And these are the current databases that uh, uh, Mongo is supporting right now. There's an administrative database and this local database, right? Uh, and we'll get uh, into what that means in a second. What we maybe don't quite realize just yet, um, but we will see, is that we are typing JavaScript into this. Yeah, Everything that we do is going to be JavaScript. When we try to insert entries or we try to update entries or delete entries, we're going to type commands and then pass them JavaScript objects. So just like normal JavaScript objects, the curly braces with the uh, property key value pairs, and then we arrays and everything. I mean, it's literally JavaScript, yeah? Well, our interface to MongoDB is JavaScript. Uh, we gave this show DBs command, and we see a list of the current databases. The way Mongo organizes information so abstractly and so that we can use it, you will have separate databases, or DB that exists independently of one another, right? And so I've got admin, contains some stuff for the MongoDB system itself, local, whatever that is, and then we can create other databases. That way you can have more than one database supported on one machine, right? So if you were running a, a virtual server and you had 50 clients all running their web applications on your system and you wanted each of them to have their own database, you just make 50 databases on your one MongoDB server and give each one of them access to that database. Yeah. We are building a blogging application, so we probably want a, a blog database. So we can make a database blog, and then we will tell MongoDB to use that database for everything we do. Um, what kind of stuff are we going to do? Inside databases will be, as we sort of discussed last week, a number of collections that each contain documents, right? These are analogous to tables in SQL and rows. So you can imagine that collections are like tables and documents are like rows. Or if you're more familiar with Excel, you can imagine that each one of these uh, uh, tables is, is, is its own Excel spreadsheet. And inside of them, you have a number of entries in your Excel spreadsheet, right? Um, and in fact, like, you could have a whole worksheet in Excel. Uh, so the file itself, you could think of that as being the database. So you could have multiple Excel files. Inside of each Excel file, you'll have particular sheets, I suppose. And then inside of each sheet, you'll have a row. And that's like databases, collections, and documents. Or in the SQL world, databases, tables, and rows. This is how Mongo organizes this information at this kind of abstract layer that uh, 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 organize or form how we interact with it. But there's not a primary key? Mongo doesn't use primary keys? Anything? Uh, there is no such thing, no. Yeah. So uh, Mongo does use an underscore ID key, which is used to, uh, which is for uniquely identifying an object. Um, and Mongo will create it. It won't be an integer. It'll be a special object ID thing. Um, but it serves a similar function. Okay. So um, we're going to, in fact, see how to use that. So, OK, so knowing this, we need to tell, before we can do anything with Mongo, what database we're using. Yeah. If I try to insert something, so if I try to make a new document and insert it into a collection, Mongo doesn't know what database to stick it in. And so I need to tell it what database I'm using, and that will form the context for everything else that we want to do in it. When I type that help command, You'll see down here there is a use and then provide the DB name. That sets the current database. That sets the current context. So if I want to use a blog, I don't need to create it or anything like that. I just need to say use blog. And Mongo goes, OK, I switched to that database. Now, anything I do will be in the context of a blog database. Mongo has not created it yet. Mongo uh, uses lazy in instantiation, which means that it doesn't actually make anything it doesn't need until you actually insert any, something into the database. We haven't created anything in our blog's database, so but Mongo knows, hey, you're in this context, and if I make something, I'm now going to, you know, if you make something, I'm, I am going to create that blog database and start sticking stuff into it. Um, that's simple enough. Uh, in practical purposes, it just means nothing's there until we actually make something be there, right? I can demonstrate this if I do show DBs. Blog is not listed there yet, right? 
Mongo does not care until I actually do something. What are we going to do in our Mongo database? So this is an idea that I've been introducing as we started talking about resourceful routes when we were thinking about modeling last week, when we were uh, you know, building our web application. There are four operations that a database has to support at a minimum for it to be a legitimate or viable storage system. It's called CRUD, Create, Retrieve, Update, and Delete. Those are the four things that we are going to learn how to do today. That's what we're going to focus on. MongoDB supports a lot more than that. So MongoDB supports sharding, which lets us split the database across multiple machines. MongoDB supports geolocation-based queries, which lets us find geopoints close to one another using Mongo's own query syntax for that. MongoDB supports uh, MapReduce, which is another, um, another way of uh, addressing information in a database that is pretty awesome, but is totally beyond the scope of our class. It's totally beyond the scope of what we're doing here. Those are all things you'll be able to learn yourself at some point if you're interested in this. But for now, what we absolutely have to be able to do is create, retrieve, update, and delete yeah, at a minimum. And so that's what we're going to focus on today. That's what we're going to learn how to do right now. Like I say, we're going to learn how to do it in Mongo. And then on Wednesday, we're going to learn how to do it from Node. So Node will be our client. And then we'll be able to do it from Node whenever somebody hits a URL on our server. We'll get back objects from the database, and then we'll be able to send them to our views to be rendered so we can print them out to the screen and generate a web page from them, right? So and that'll be, we're going to, that's when we connect it. But for now, let's learn how to do the CRUD operations. Let me pause for a second. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Okay. What's up? Uh, it should stick it in your program files, so C program files, so you'll need to get it to it through it, it, Explorer. It, it, it won't show up in your start menu. Um, so you'll need to manually navigate it uh, to it on your computer. Um, create this directory for, uh, for storing the data. So, so maybe write that down because I'm not going to keep bringing the screen up. Uh, MD for make directory backslash data backslash DB. So you can type that into a command prompt, an actual command prompt, not one of Git's uh, terminals or Git bash. And then you should find a Mon some kind of MongoDB 2.6 standard or whatever inside of your C program files directory. Inside of that folder is a bins directory. Inside of that folder is a mongod.exe and a mongo.exe. And that's what you want to run. Or, yeah, the installation page. OK. Any other questions? So then you can run, just type in that previous one. Go back to that one. I'll pause for a second. Thanks, Todd. And just type in uh, show DBS, show space DBS. Yeah, you're working. Boom. You're all set. All right. And so now do a use uh, use blog yeah. to set your context for a blog database. Cool. Now anything that you do is going to show up inside of that database. All right. Good. So we're getting there. We're smoothing out our rough spots. Let's create something inside of MongoDB. So we have, we're have we making a blogging system. Uh, we're probably going to have... So what kind of collections are we going to have? We're probably going to have... Posts. We might have comments, and we might have users. Those are those are three things you can imagine a blogging application needing to keep track of. So let's let's create a post. When we create something inside of MongoDB, we target a particular collection. Actually, actually, just about anything we do inside of MongoDB is going to target a particular collection. The way you do that every single time is to address it through the DB object. So everything we do is going to begin with DB object that we uh, use dot uh, syntax to get access to its uh, attributes or its properties. And it's really just like a JavaScript object, right? So I'm saying DB. I then give it the name of the collection I want to use. Um, or again, the name of the table or the worksheet, however you want to think about this. <laughs> Just to be clear, the collection that you're saying is post, mm -hmm. but post is in blog. That's so right. So it's like blog.post. That's right. 
Okay, and so you can use that syntax there if you refer if you have multiple data. You can say no. DB, oh, okay. I, mu I have to use DB dot. That's why we say use blog. Okay. Because now DB kind of stands for blog, right? That's a good question. So it'd be nicer if I could just say blog dot posts. Yeah, I cannot. I have to set the database I'm using first, and then DB dot address a collection inside of that data. Dot. Now I'm going to do something to that collection, right? So creating a post is called inserting it in Mongo. I say db.posts, insert. And this is a JavaScript command, right? So I'm calling a method on an object in JavaScript. Let's just do it by itself. So db.posts.insert with parentheses, because I'm calling a method. Press return. Says no object passed to insert. I haven't told Mongo what I want to insert, what data I want to give it. So let's try that again. Let's try it with an empty JavaScript object. And so recall that a JavaScript object is just something between, uh, a JavaScript object literal is something between two curly braces. So I'm saying I'm giving Mongo empty data, two curly braces. And that should work. And so you'll see a flurry of activity over in the server if you've still got your server running in a window. And then you should get right result, and then in number inserted one. So what happened? This command that we gave the REPL got sent over to the database. The database executed it and gave us a status update message back. And then our client printed that out to the console. Yeah. How do we know? Or, oh, better than that. Now, do show DBs. Blog now appears in the list. So actually creating something causes blog to appear. And what you may have noticed was that actually took a long time for creating an object. That's because the whole database system had to be created for it. Now, if you insert something into your uh, into your uh, post collection or into blog somewhere, it'll happen very quickly. So, if I do show collections, similar to show DBs, I will see the collections that now exist in this database. Previously, that was empty. Currently, it has posts and system indexes, which is used internally by MongoDB to track indices. So I have a post collection inside of my MongoDB, or my blog database, excuse me. And that post collection should contain a single object, the one that I just created, right? How do we get it back? Uh, db.posts, so again, remember, everything I want to do is going to target a particular collection on the current <laughs> database. And then I can just say find as the, as the method. So db.posts.find. And there it is, the empty object that I just created. Notice that it's not quite empty. It has this ID attribute that I did not specify, but which MongoDB uh, automatically creates for us anytime we insert something into the database. This is the unique identifier that will uniquely find this object in any running instance of MongoDB on any computer anywhere. MongoDB guarantees that this will be a unique string. So it does, uh, does that through a combination of your uh, unique identifier on your computer, the current timestamp, the process ID for uh, the Mongo instance that's running, and so forth. So that way, if you were running the same database across multiple servers and you created two objects at the exact same time or any point in time, you're guaranteed that this string of digits will be different, So, which is pretty impressive, uh, figuring that it's like 26 plus 10 to the 16th or whatever, right? So that's a lot of combinations. We will use this parameter to find this object again through uh, our URLs, right? So when somebody says, give me all the posts, I could run this find command, and I would get all of these things back. It would give me a whole list of these, and I could show them. And then somehow I would keep track of the fact that this thing is one of them in the link. And so I could make a link on my page to posts and then this string, right? And then when they click on that, they're going to request the URL that matches the route posts colon ID that we learned about in the last few classes. And I will be able to pull this string out of that URL, so URL parameter, and then use it to find this object in particular. That's how this is all going to come together on Wednesday. Yeah. Give you a little bit of a preview of how that works. But so what are we doing? <laughs> We're interacting with MongoDB using JavaScript by targeting commands such as 
insert and find on this db dot collection name object, and our collection is posts. Is that so? Is that clear? Is, is that does that make sense? It's, you know, once you get to our, you start off rough and it's uh, it hits your confidence. Go, like, oh. but I think this is pretty straightforward. Yeah. Let's create something a little bit more. First, let's uh, let's delete all these things. So um, I've created this empty object. We don't actually want empty objects. We just wanted to see how that was possible. Do this for now. We'll learn more about this in a second. But db.posts.delete. Uh, uh, apparently not delete. Is it uh, destroy? I forget offhand. Should double check. It could even be remove. My uh, my way. You know what it is offhand? Yeah, to drop. In fact, so to the point, so if I do help. The delete, that's right. Is it delete? Yeah. I think you have to put an, oh, I think you can't just put the, I think you have to put curly braces or something in there. I don't think you can just do open mm. paren, close paren. No, no, that should be. Dot, no, it should be. Yeah, you have, that's why you have listed. Remove, do I have, yeah, why didn't it work but for I, me? Yeah, I don't get the same thing. Property delete is not a function. Did, blog did delete work for other people? It's, I think it's, drop. it's drop? No, that would drop the whole thing, That's which is not quite what I want to do. I do want to just delete. This is annoying. Well, can we just we can delete just the object if you know the object Yeah, weird, but by itself it should it should delete all of them, which is what I've got down. So if that's not working for you, sorry not ls, db.post.find. I have this object ID. I can target that object ID. So copy this whole thing right here, and do. No, nah, but it's, uh, if you specify a query, but delete should work as well as what I was using before. No. Oh, db dot. It's sort of like that, right? So what we'll. Uh, that's what we want. Ah, I keep on mistyping things. DB delete worked. Maybe. So it's just, oh, it's just DB delete. DB delete. Yes. It oh yeah, we don't put the parens or anything. That can't be right. DB delete worked. Well, well, DB dot delete. Like that? Uh huh. No. No. Just DB delete. No. Because you're not targeting the post, and we want to do it on post. No Property delete object blog post function. Nope. Show DBs. Show users. DB dot food. DB dot. Let's look it up. This is why we like documentation. Installation crud. Crud tutorials. Deleting an object, insert, insert modify, remove. Yeah, they say me remove. Maybe I just mistyped it. So db dot posts dot remove needs a query. Give it an empty object. Here we go. That's my mistake. All right. So check it out. What are we doing? We have an object in our database. We want to delete it. We have to call remove, not delete. Sorry, that's my mistake. And then we, again, target the collection that on the database that we want to do this on. We say db.post.remove. We'll learn more about this in a second. Uh, right now, we're just clearing it so we can move on with our create examples. And I give it an empty JavaScript object, like that. Does that mean like all of them? That means all of them. That's exactly right. Make sure if you show DBs, you still have a blog. So yeah. Kevin, do you still have a blog after doing db.delete? Uh, Shouldn't do anything, just right? Returns, uh, just returns. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> yep. And if we show collections, we still see posts. So this is not the same thing as dropping a table. If you guys are familiar with SQL, you can drop a table in SQL that just completely gets rid of the table. Mongo says well, post is still there, even though post doesn't have anything in it. We can confirm that post doesn't have anything in it with a find db.post.find doesn't return anything, right? There's nothing in posts anymore, although I can still run queries against it. Okay, so do we get that? So that moved really quickly. That's not really 
I should follow the script when I prepare these things. <laughs> Let's actually create a real blog post so that we can see how this would work. Yeah. When I call db.posts.insert, I'm going to pass it a JavaScript object. I'm going to do this on multiple lines so that we can see what this looks like. We can do that in Mongo. The REPL just waits for me to complete the JavaScript object, just like it does in Node. So db.insert, open parentheses, open curly braces. It's a JavaScript object literal, which is name or uh, name value or key value pairs. Remember, property, colon, value, comma, more of those. And so I could say, let's make a title. This is a Mongo test in quotes because it's a string. And then comma, and I can add additional attributes. So body, I'll just say lorem ipsum, comma, and then an author. And for now, I'll just say, OK, coders, you can make these whatever you want. I don't need a comma. It'll be my last one. And then I need to close my JavaScript object with the curly braces. And then close the, the execution of the command with uh, close parentheses, right? And I should get a right result in inserted colon one. Or if you have a syntax error, it'll tell you that you have a syntax error. This is just JavaScript, though. That's really the critical point here, right? So we're using tools and uh, programming languages that we're already familiar with. How can I confirm that this guy got put in my database? What's the command? Find and how db.posts.find, right? Specifically, db.posts.find. It's a command, it's a method, so I put the parentheses. And now I see again that there's an object in here. It's been assigned an object ID, but I've got my title, I've got my body, and I've got my author, right? This is how we're going to create things in our database. So the C part of CRUD, we use this db.insert. We can, so we've passed a JavaScript object to this thing. We can insert more than one item at a time by passing an array. And it's just a JavaScript array, right? It's an array of objects. Um, let's not do it because it's a lot of writing, but I could do db.post.insert array, some kind of object, another kind of object, separated by commas in my array, right? And then close the array and so forth. That'll give me a syntax error, which is fine. But uh, that would be the, uh, you know, the format that you would do that. And it's OK to pass an array to this co the command. Let's create a couple more blog posts, not with this array, because the syntax gets hairy, but just doing it this way, db.posts.insert. That way we have some data that we can work with. So db.posts.insert. Oop, excuse me. Ah. JavaScript object, title. On Mongo, anything you want. It doesn't really matter. Although we might have some consistency because we're going to do some queries against this. Uh, body, we'll just always say lorem ipsum for the body for now. And then for the author, let's do Mr. T. <laughs> we know who that is, which is funny because I actually use Mr. T for an example when I'm doing this in my other in the in the class at OU. So don't forget your syntax. It's always a little annoying uh, typing this stuff in a REPL. You got to get your commas and your curly braces and your parentheses just right. But when you get it done, it should look like that, right? Just type in a JavaScript object. Do that a couple of times. So db.posts.insert. I'll add one more here. Title, another Mongo example. Body, Molom Ipsum. Author, OK Coders. So these are just strings. Just they're, it's just JavaScript, yeah. Okay. Yep. They're just strings inside of an object, inside of a call to a method in JavaScript. That's right. It doesn't have to be a string. No, it could be anything. So it could be any JavaScript thing, right? We'll see that in a little bit. Um, other possibilities could be a null, uh, a null, sorry, or a Boolean value. Type the information in out of order. Doesn't matter. Okay. So order will not matter. So you don't have to specify like what data type or anything is. It's going to take care of that? That's exactly right. Um, we're going to talk about that a little bit towards the end of the class. Uh, that's, what, that's partly what makes Node a schema-less database. Uh, we are not, if you've, how many of you guys have used SQL before, SQL users? 
You know when you use SQL, you have to create your table before you can do anything with it, and when you create the table, you specify its columns and what type they are. Mongo does not care. So I can just start creating stuff inside of a collection, and it makes documents inside of that collection. Um, and we talked about this last week. Documents are kind of like rows, and collections are kind of like tables. That's one way to think about it. But importantly, when I do this db.posts.find, notice that each one of these objects, in a sense, carries its columns with it. This object knows it has a title, a body, and an author, uh, and an underscore ID, right? Each one of these objects knows that. So there's no schema that applies to every object in a, or every document in a collection. The document knows what its schema itself is. Okay? And we'll see what that means uh, towards the end of the class, is that objects in a collection can have different attributes. Yeah, we don't have to share, they can have different attributes. We don't have to share the same attributes. I can have two posts, who have completely different attributes from each other. One of them might not have a title. The other one might not have an author. In one of them, the author might actually be an array of strings instead of a single string. In another one, I might have an embedded document for a body rather than a string. Um, so we don't have to specify that in advance with MongoDB, and we don't have to be consistent about the application. Does that make a difference, though, when that's when you query and you start searching? Absolutely, right? And so that's not necessarily a good thing, um, what we'll talk about is that it can make prototyping an application much faster. So it's like, oh, I don't care what my table looks like right now. I'm just hacking away at this thing. And then once you have a sense for what kind of data you'll have in your table, you might kind of lock down a format, but it will never be official. It'll be up to your application to follow your specifications. And so what we, uh, for those of you who are familiar with SQL, a lot of what happens, and I mentioned this earlier, is that the logic for the database, the logic for your data storage management system is moved out of the database layer and into your application layer. It is the responsibility of your application to make sure it's doing things correctly. The database is not going to care, right? Whereas SQL cares very much. If you do something incorrectly, it just doesn't let you insert it, right? Or it doesn't let you query against it or whatever. You'll get an error. Okay, so I should have a few objects in here, right? I've created, uh, I've created a few objects. That is creation in MongoDB. db.collectionName.insert. That's it. It's that simple. There's no weird SQL. We simply give it an object or an array of objects, and it sticks that in our database. What if we want to create uh, some documents inside of a collection, uh, excuse me, inside of a comments collection? What are we going to do? What's the command that we would use? I want to create objects or documents inside of a comments collection. Another, um, that, right? That's exactly right. So we don't have to create the collection in advance. We want to create another object. So how do we create the other object? What's the actual command for that? DB dot name of the collection. What's the name of the collection? Comments dot insert. And now I can create comments. And so I can make, make a comment. It could have a title as well. Actually, let's just have it have a body. Uh, lorem ipsum for the comment. And then maybe it's got a views. Let's make a views property. Views 12. So just demonstrating that we can have numbers in there as well. Because it's just JavaScript, right? And then I close the JavaScript object, and I close the call to the command. And now I have, if I show collections, a post collection and a comments collection, yeah? Independent of one another. Operations, remember, every operation that we do in Mongo is in the context of a database, which we specify with use database name. And then anything we do will be on a db.collection name. So I'm either doing it to db.posts, or I'm doing it to db.comments, or I'm doing it to db.users, or whatever, right? Questions about that? Okay, so we're creating objects in our database. We've got posts and we've got uh, comments. How do we get these objects? So we've done the C part of CRUD. How do we retrieve them? What about the R part of CRUD or the git, the, uh, the query or whatnot? We've already seen that the easiest way to do this is with the find command. So if I do db.post.find just by itself, of course with the parentheses, I get all my posts back. 
if I do db dot excuse me comments yeah, dot find I get my comments back yeah it's that simple find that is my um, my from command basically in, in SQL right we can add query parameters to the find command. So what we're going to find, what we're going to see that we do is that we pass a JavaScript object to find that targets properties on the documents that are in that collection. And then this is like writing a where clause in SQL where it will only find objects on this collection that match the properties inside of this JavaScript object. Let's call it the query object. So I think the simplest example of this, let me do db.posts.find. Each one of these has properties, ID property, title property, body property, author property. I can do db.posts.find, and I'm going to pass it a JavaScript object similar to when I create, and now I'm going to target one of these properties. Let's target the ID property. This is a JavaScript object, um, so I just do underscore ID colon, and I'm going to target one of these object IDs, so I'm just going to copy and paste this thing like that. And I need this whole thing, right? I can't just provide this string. I actually need to use this object ID syntax, which is, makes it an object ID object. So. And then I can close my query object, and then close my call to find. And now, MongoDB is only returning one result back instead of all of my posts. It's only returning the posts where this value matches this parameter, where the object ID matches the ID parameter. Yeah? And we know that I have that in my posts because that's where I pulled it from. Right? This is how I'm going to query for specific objects or specific documents in my collection. So how I'm going to subset documents in my collection and only pull out ones that match certain criteria. When would you do something like this? db.post.find and pass it an ID? So exactly when they, when they go to that URL on your site, posts ID. And because of the way that we built the posts page, the URL that we provide that they click on is going to be posts, and then whatever this is, 5.3, CD, whatever, right? And our application will be able to pull this thing out of uh, the URL in that ID param, and then use it when it's querying Mongo, right? So let's see another example of this. I can query against anything, uh, any attribute on the documents in this collection. So what else do I have? I have an author. One of my authors is Mr. T. One of my other authors is OK Coders. So I could do instead db.posts.find. And again, I'm in this JavaScript object. And I could say author colon OK Coders. No, well, the author attribute does not have an underscore. So. And again, remember, this thing right here, uh, so just to clarify, is just an attribute of those documents in that collection, right? I said posts have an author. Okay, so I'm going to query for certain posts with this author. And then I give it the value that I'm looking for. When I do that, I get back only the two uh, documents whose author matches OK coders. This is like a where statement in SQL or a where clause in SQL. Where authors equals or authors like, or authors matches, whatever it is, quotes, OK coders. If I did this alternatively, or alternately instead of for OK coders, I did it for Mr. T, I get back the one object whose author matches Mr. T. What if I just wanted to search in body the word ipsum? Could I? Absolutely. So let's say I want to search in body for the word ipsum. How do we do that in SQL? Anybody know off the top of their heads? Sort of like a like. Yeah, use percent like percent and then give it the string that you kind of want to match against, right? You do like and then you do quote percent the string you want to match. Ah, percent there you go. Quote. Right. And so the percent will then match any characters on left or the right. 
In Mongo, since we're using JavaScript, and JavaScript supports regular expressions, which I've kind of mentioned but we haven't gone into, I can provide a regular expression to match against any string attribute. So let's say I want to find the body, or any post whose body, so where the body, matches some regular expression. And JavaScript's regular expressions are put between forward slashes. I specify the expression itself, so I could say ipsum. And then I could specify uh, after, uh, properties of that ex regular expression, like case insensitive. So I do forward slash ipsum forward slash lowercase i. That's a regular expression that matches any text that is that contains ipsum anywhere in it and doesn't care about its case. And then I can close that with the curly braces because I'm closing a JavaScript object, and then I close that with open parenthesis. And now it finds anywhere in this text where ipsum occurs in the body. That happens to be all three of these, right, because I have this in my body, or all of them have ipsum in it. But I could do, uh, let's do it with authors. So I could say author, colon, regular expression, OK, case insensitive. So it's going to find me any, any post whose attribute author ma value matches the regular expression, OK, case insensitive. Obviously, that should find OK coders, even though OK is capitalized, right? And that's exactly what it does. It returns to two objects whose author value matches that particular regular expression. So with Node and everything, we can write these as JavaScript functions. That's right. And so what we're going to find on Wednesday is that Mongo provides a library for interacting with the database. Uh, we, you know, the require statement that we've been using will require it into our web application. And then we have a very similar interface where we actually write stuff like this to query Mongo. That's right. When you say regular expression, what constitutes a regular expression? Um, there's a particular grammar that defines what a regular expression is. Uh, it's called the regular grammar. Um, and it's that means that uh, the language follows a particular syntax that can be analyzed with a mathematical construction known as a finite state automata, uh, which is a way of specifying relationships between entities in a string of bits. And then, like, going back and forth between these relationships as it tries to match that string of bits. Um, and it can do it with characters. Um, so if you're using a backslash, then you have to have a regular expression inside of that? If you're using those two forward slashes. That, that means in, that is the syntax in JavaScript for this is a regular expression. So. And, what's that? Uh, was there anything that, that preceded author? Like a, a, a parenthesis or... Okay. Okay. Regular expressions are a bit maybe too advanced uh, for this. If you probably, if you're CS, you might have had some exposure to them. Um, they're pretty awesome. They're not necessary for what we're going to be doing with our blog application, but they, if you've used SQL before, they can demonstrate the power of getting really refined searches. Regular expressions let you find matches in text that are almost like just impossible to find anyway else. Yeah. I can say, match me the thing that's inside of parenthesis, inside of parenthesis, that begins with this letter and then has two other letters between it of any type, and then is followed by five numbers. And then just find that in my text. And where it matches it, give me the result back. Uh, regular expressions give you this insane control over text pattern matching. So uh, they're pretty sweet, but way beyond the scope of the class. So. When we are querying, so when we are doing this retrieving, the R part of CRUD in Mongo, it is always going to look like this. So I'll just clear that line and show it to you. We will always do a db dot collection name dot find and then pass it a JavaScript object. And that JavaScript object contains attributes or properties, right, that match the properties of those in that collection, of those documents in that collection, and then we say what values it is that we're looking for. Yeah. Is that clear how this matching works? Yeah. So if our comments has a body and a views, we can do a query for some value of views. We could even do greater than or less than or some more advanced queries. But we will always, when we do a find, pass a JavaScript object with some collection of attributes and values that will search against the attributes and values of the documents in that collection. And it turns out 
that when we use the update command and uh, the remove command, and I've mistakenly got it down here as the delete command, which is a terrible mistake, but uh, when we use the update and the remove command, we will also pass it a query parameter like this, and it will find all the objects that match that query parameter and then let us update all those objects or let us delete all those objects. But this is sort of a fundamental design pattern to using a node. We're always going to do stuff where we're giving, this, giving it this query object and saying, find me, subset, those items in the collection. Find me the documents, which is to say the posts or the comments or the users that match that query. Super fundamental to how we use node. Let's talk about one more thing before we take a break. In SQL, Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, oh, okay, I'll say it now. Uh, RoboMongo is a visual client. So rather than you know having to type all this into the shell, you can type it into RoboMongo, and it gives like a visual representation, kind of like SQL Mapping Studio. Cool. I've tried Mongo Hub, I think is what it's called. There was some application I tried on the Mac, and it was just awful. RoboMongo. Do you download it? Yeah. Or does it run in your shell? Oh, look at that. Slightly more advanced GUI, so cool. And there's a client for Windows. Presumably, you're still typing commands like this into it, though, yeah. like the find and stuff, but it'll give you a visual thing back. Right. Cool. Which is a bit nicer to interact with than, say, the shell. Yeah. So, sweet. If it was something else, <laughs> I think the something else was my thing, right? Yeah. RoboMongo. <laughs> Worth mentioning. Cool. OK, so last thing before we take a break here. In SQL, there's the select statement, right, which is known as projection and actual underlying grammar for it. Uh, it's where we specify what attributes we want to get back from that, uh, that row. Yeah? So it's like I might have, a, uh, if I'm thinking in terms of Excel spreadsheets, I might have a table with like 50 columns. And every time I have an entry in that uh, table or in that Excel document or that worksheet, it'll have 50 data points for that one entry. In a database, I'll have a SQL table that might have 50 columns with 50 data points for every single entry. And when I make a query against that table and I get back that particular item, I might not want to get back all 50 data points. I might only want to get back a subset of those data points. So like, only give me the title or only give me the author. I don't care about everything else. That may not seem like a big deal when our objects or our documents only have like three attributes, title, body, author. But when your documents have 50 attributes and you're making a query against your database and you're getting 100,000 back, you're getting 50,000 50, data points, right? That's a lot more information than saying, well, really, I only need the title because that's the only thing my application cares about right now. So we need a way of selecting a subset of the fields or a subset of the attributes, the properties, from the document, right? So when I do this db.post.find, I get back everything. I get back the ID, I get back the title, I get back the body, and I get back the author. What I'm saying is, I only want the title back. I only want the author back. I don't care about everything else. Just give me that back. How can we do that in Mongo? I can do db.post.find, let's say, and then I pass it two objects instead of one. The first object is always going to be my query object, right? If I pass it a query object, what does that mean? Or an empty query object, what does that mean? What do you think it means? <clears throat> everything. Give me everything. Comma. Now I'm going to pass it a second object, right? And I need to fill in the second object with some stuff. This second object here, again, lets me specify a collection of attributes that these particular documents have, like a title, and say, hey, the title is what I want, true. Right? This is going to be a set of Boolean key value pairs where the attributes are attributes of the documents in this collection, such as title, body, author, and then true or false for whether or not I want those attributes back. This is like a select statement in SQL. Uh, and I only need to specify true for the ones that I want. I can just ignore the rest. And so when I do this, and I close my JavaScript object, my second JavaScript object, and close the command, I will get back all those objects, but it's only giving me the title now. It always gives me the ID. 
I don't have control over that. But notice I'm not giving the author or the body. That's the important point here, right? So that lets me narrow down uh, the data that I get back. So, and that's an important feature if you if you don't want to get 50, you know 50,000, 50 million data points from your database. You only want to get one million. So, <laughs> and it's really yeah, right? Okay. One day, when you you know, I mean, I have a blog that's got a million posts on it. <laughs> so, um, but how does that work? Again, looking at that syntax, we pass two objects. The first object is our query object. The second object is our projection object, or the select object in SQL, right? And that lets us choose what fields we want to get back. Let's take a break. It's a lot, um, but we're moving along pretty well. We're going to get through all of this information. The other stuff is not that hard. Hopefully, this is not that hard. We're conceptually orienting ourselves in how to use Mongo. The, so far, the real stuff that's important is that we have databases. Our databases contain collections. Our collections contain documents. We tell Mongo what database we want to use. We target a collection. We insert documents into it. We update documents in it. We delete documents in it, and so forth. Um, so far, we've looked at inserting and querying. When we query, we always specify a query object, right? And we're going to see that we use that for updating and deleting as well. OK, five minute break, and then we'll get back into it. so they do marketing yeah. solutions. Um, well, it's marketing of sorts, but it's really, um, I mean, yeah, yeah, in the sense that, that they have client-facing stuff, like if you type in something in uh, Google search, it will have uh, some of their material that uh, would be geared toward really comparisons uh, between the, the various uh, plans. Uh, but their, their interfaces are really leading edge stuff. It's like there's stuff like this is stuff that I saw with their code and Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. The, the, um, and the query with the, the parentheses within for the curly braces. Yeah, yeah. And, and then a really know, complex yeah, query. <laughs> yeah, so I understand you know, what that is. It's calling like a whole database. And then, and then narrowing it down, filtering, yeah. basically. It makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yep, that's it. I'm really lucky I got this. Place. Yeah, that's awesome. So yeah. we, that, we have nervous. <laughs> nervous. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to discover me. <laughs> no, they knew. I was completely honest. Yeah. yeah it's like, start now. That's, well, I mean, that make, that probably makes them excited because then they get to develop you, like, right. tailor to their right. Right. Solution, right. So. And they, that's how they bring people in. Yeah. Uh, practically everyone there started out, started out as an intern. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's just lucky to get in. It's like, don't worry about what you pay me. I just really want the experience. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're paying me, but it's not, you know, the level of the software engineer would make it. But still, I mean, start somewhere. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome, man. That's yeah. what you wanted, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> you gave me a laptop. And really? Yeah, Windows. You already have a laptop. I know. You know. The guy's like, do you want to use it? I said, yeah, of course. Sure, why not? I want them both. Yeah, Let's learn how to use Learn get good at Windows. Yeah. Why not? Then you'll know how to do both. Important. Yeah, sure. They're a window shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it makes so, sense. Use the use the system that they're using. So. But just was saying, I did use a you know, virtual machine. Yeah. That's what I was trying to run earlier. You'd probably have more luck running it on your Mac. I, I run into problems because I'm running it onto a second hard drive, I think. But if you just VMware plus a Windows install, it should work just fine. But no office hours for me. Uh, oh well, that well that's even that's better though. Yeah. You'll learn. You'll pick up stuff so fast because you're just gonna have to do it. Like, yeah, so you're gonna do it and it's not gonna work, and you do it and it's not gonna work, and you do it and it works, and be like, all right, I know how to do that. Now. And it's great because they care. Yeah, you do pair programming. Yeah, yeah. yeah so awesome. Working with Jesse. 
Jesse's Jesse's yeah. cool too, so Dude. Yeah, man. <laughs> that's awesome. So, <laughs> yeah. So much to learn. So little time. But even for them, like even every ex every any experience, the anxiety every programmer has, every single programmer has, is that like they're not gonna know what the next thing that they need to know is. Like you always have to be learning stuff. So it's like, oh shit, I'm gonna fall behind. I don't know what I need to know. Right. But that's every programmer's anxiety, whether you're just starting out or you've been doing it for 30 well, years. Well, thanks for it. It's good to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not. No, know. even for them. Even for them. Because they'll be using technologies that you're learning now that right. they just learned how to use. That's a good I'm like, this is only a year old. Yeah. Everything, yeah, it's brand new stuff. Yeah. Like, Mongo's been around for maybe six, seven years. Like, not that long. Like, maybe a little longer than that. I feel like it's 2006 or 2007, but nobody's really been using it for more than a few years. So. Mm -hmm. Who's got popcorn? Uh, Greg. Is it Greg? Greg, yeah. Okay. Who came up and talked? Yeah. Right. Popcorn. What? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, really loud I'm hungry. No, it's good. Did they have that here? Did you, or did you bring that with you? Damn. You told me you were trying to get me to get it like a week ago. I was like, oh no, it's going to be too loud. <laughs> was it loud You want some? Yeah. 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 Wow, it is sweet. I never had sweet popcorn before. Yeah, this rubber mango is better. It looks more like access or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, the other one I've used never worked really well, so I, I gave up on the command line interface. In all honesty, though, most of the stuff that you do is going to be through JavaScript in your application. Like, once we get that running, you won't really connect to it from the command line. So, But this gives us all the tools we need to know to understand how CRUD stuff works in Mongo. So. I think I will give this a shot, though. It looks all right. Cool. That's even G and U. GNU. All right, let's uh, let's get together again. Okay, so what I'm doing here, 
I'm just adding a whole bunch of posts to my database so that I can demonstrate the next thing that I'm going to talk about here. So I've just added a bunch of posts. I copied them from this uh, post.js sample that we used in a previous lesson. So I'm literally just like grab an object, do a db.post.insert with that object, and I get all this stuff back. And it's giving me a bunch of posts. I have way more posts than I had before. So let me only grab the, say, the uh, ID. So now I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven posts, right? At some point, you're going to have 100 posts, and then you're going to have 1,000 posts, and then you're going to have 10,000 posts, and then you're going to have 100,000 posts, or whatever kind of data that you're dealing with. And you're going to want to page through this data. Um, in SQL, you'll see stuff like order by and then limit. So you can control what order the data is coming back to you in, and then you can control how many of those things you want to get back, as well as where you start. So like you can say, order by the author's name, skip the first 10 entries, and give me the next 10. Yeah? And then you'll have a little link on your page that says next, and you'll make a call to the database that says, order by author, skip the first 20 entries, give me the next 10. Next. Order by author, skip the first 30 entries, give me the next 10, and so forth. Yeah? That's called paging or using a cursor to move through your data. Turns out this is ridiculously easy to do in Mongo, uh, and I want to show you how to do that real quick. So, What I'm going to do is, again, I'm just going to do this db.post.find, and you can go and say, give me everything. Uh, you know, If you're doing it like that, you could just do it this way. I am going to, in fact, specify that I only want the IDs because I added all of those uh, extra bits of information there, and my bodies are huge. Uh, maybe I could say, give me the titles. So I'll say, title true. Maybe that's a little more real life, right? Let's say I want to sort these by my author. So I give it the exact same command, and then the object that this returns... I can make calls on. So it looks like I'm getting back a list of objects, but that's not actually the case. I'm actually getting back an object when I call this, and that object has methods on it that I can call. So using the dot notation, I can do what's called method chaining and say db.post.find, and you can just have yours db.post.find, um, and then dot sort, right? And let's go ahead and get rid of this other stuff. Screw it to keep it simple. So again, it's just really db.post.find parentheses, because I'm actually calling it, dot, and then another method, sort. And again, I'm going to pass, this is going to be a really familiar pattern, a JavaScript object with the attributes, such as, say, author, that I want to sort by. And I'm going to use a 1 for ascending, which is means start from the lowest value, go to the highest value. So an author whose name begins with A will appear first before one who begins with Z. Or a negative one, which means sort descending, so that Z would appear before A, right? But I'll say one. I could specify more than one values to sort on more than one values when two of them are equal. So I could say title negative one. And this is a JavaScript object, so I close it with curly braces, and then I close my call to sort with a, a closed parenthesis. But be careful here. Watch your syntax. We are calling find. We're just calling another method on what find returns. And again, this is known as method chaining. And I do that, and we won't really see the difference, but my uh, returned objects are now being sorted by author and title. And that's as simple as calling dot sort, and then using that same sort of query object syntax, but using a negative one or a one to control how you're ascending or descending it. It's ridiculously simple. So I can sort. I can also skip and limit. So when I call db.post.find, and again, I am going to limit this. I'm only going to return my ID so we can really see what that is showing me. Let's skip the first three of these. So I say dot .skip and give it three, the number that I want to skip. And it will only return the ones that occur after that, so the last four ones. So it skips these three, returns these four. Yeah, And that's as simple as saying dot skip. I could say skip three and limit it to one. So I say dot skip three, dot limit one. And so it's going to skip the first three and only give me the next one. 
and so on. And this is just brutally easy to do in MongoDB. There's no you know, order by limit in a complex where clause as part of your massive SQL statement. You call another method on your dot find, and it handles it for you internally. Yeah, it's pretty nice. They're really easy to do. Um, and very common inside of a system. So it's like when somebody goes to your front page, so they go to your posts on your blog, and you've got 100 posts in your blog, are you going to show them 100 posts? Probably not. Probably you're going to show them the first 10 ordered by date created. And so you could do db.post.find.sort a JavaScript object date created, ascending or descending, as it were, because you want to show your most recent ones first, dot limit to 10. Uh, and, oop, I have a syntax error. And then it'll give me the 10 most recent objects sorted by date created, limited to only 10 of them, right? It's that easy. And then you could have a, you know, sh next, just like you see in WordPress, show me more, that then grabs all of them or grabs the next 10 or the next 50 or whatever. Yeah. But uh, ridiculously easy. There's a, people, there's a reason people like MongoDB, um, which is not to say that other databases are any better or worse. They're just different, right? So it turns out that's really easy to do. Okay, so we've got creating, we've got retrieving. Let's do updating. Updating is going to work pretty similar to how we're doing querying already. When we want to update objects in our Mongo database, we need to tell it which objects we want to update. Um, as I was telling Kevin earlier, this is a process of filtering down our collection. Yeah? Um, and so I could have made that more explicit earlier. When we have a collection that's got eight documents, we want to retrieve some of them that match certain parameters. We're only getting you know, two of those documents. That's what we're doing. We're filtering. We're subsetting. I might want to update a document. Well, I need to know which document to update. I want to grab this one. And so I'm going to use a query parameter, a uh, query object, to only select that document. How do I only select one document and guarantee to get the right one? I use that object ID, right? That's my unique identifier. But I also might want to say, you know, uh, give me all the documents that were uh, created by a particular user. So I could use that user in my query object and delete them or change their number of views or whatever, right? The gist is we're always going to be targeting a subset of our documents and then doing something with that subset when we update, and as it turns out, when we remove or delete. So let's see what that looks like. Um, the update demand is going to be a little stranger. Uh, let me grab an object ID first. So I'm going to do db.post.find, give me all my objects, and then give me only IDs. So I know that I have, say, this guy is one of my objects. So then I could say db.post.find and pass that in. Oop. As the thing that I'm filtering for. And I'm putting it all in one line just uh, you know, to make it simpler, although that uh, maybe damages the readability. It's just a JavaScript object with a parameter or with a key and a value. And that gives me back that one object. And let's go, you know what? I want to update the title for this object. Okay? So I'm going to construct a db.posts.update command. The first thing I'm going to pass to it is going to be a query object that will grab that particular post for me, that particular document. And again, I do the exact same thing that I was just doing now to grab it. Right? So first parameter is an object. And I'm saying, find me anything that matches that. I know only one matches that. Then I need to provide a second object. And this is where it gets a little weird. Yeah? This is where the update's a little strange and maybe, maybe a little worse than how SQL does it. I have a number of different kinds of updates I can do on an object in MongoDB. So I can set a new value to some attribute. So if I want to update the title, I can set the title to something new. I might want to auto-increment a value. So if I have a number here and I want to increase it by one, I could do an auto-increment update. If I have an array and I want to add an item to that array, I could do a push update. Or if I wanted to pull an item off, I could do a pop update. MongoDB supports a number of different kinds of updates, which means we have to tell it what kind of update we want to do. You'd think it's like, oh, okay, I could just specify the title, right? Unfortunately, no. First. 
I need to tell it what kind of update I do, and Mongo provides a special dollar set as the name of the property in this second object for the update I want to accomplish. And that's the weird part. I think that's a little strange. But again, this is just a key value pair inside of a JavaScript object. It, the property name is set, or dollar set. So I do a colon, and I need to give it a value. Now I want to tell it to set the title. How do I do that? I, now I give it a JavaScript object of the attributes I want to change and their new values. So I say title, and then this is a new title. That's a little hairy. I've got an object inside an object as the second parameter to update when the first parameter is also an object. So it's a slew of JavaScript objects, right? I'm going to type this in here first, and then I'll show it on the screen and in the, in the documentation. It looks a lot clearer in the documentation. But I'm basically saying update the title. I close the value for this set parameter, or for this, excuse me, set property. I close the second object. And then I've got my second object closed. I've got my first object closed. So I need to close my call to update. And then it runs it. So that, I found one, I made a change to it, mod, number modified, right? So that now if I select just that object, so db.post.find, I should get back a new title, which is in fact exactly what happens, right? That's a slightly more complex operation. What is complex about that is that I need to specify the fact that it's a set. That's really the only trick here. If I look at my uh, the documentation for that, you'll see that it's uh, quite a bit more explicit about what that looks like. It's this guy right here. db.post.update. I pass the first object, which is always my query object, and then I pass it a second object, uh, this guy right here, sorry, and inside that second object, I give it the kind of update I want to make, and then the attributes I want to change, which I stick inside of another object. Why is it that way? I don't know. That's how Mongo does it. That's the syntax we have to use for it. Yeah. But that's how you update. And so when would something like this happen? Like, let's say we have a... Is this one like if you have comments pending for approval or something and you want to add more comments to the page? Maybe you want to add more comments, or maybe I have, I'm in my administrator section of my blogging application, and I went to posts, colon, ID, edit, and I render a form back to my user, right? And that form has like a title with a field, a body with a field, and we're going to see how to do this next week. That's the plan for next week. And then a submit button, right? Lovely submit button. That will post, whereas this is a git, if you remember from those routes that we made, to posts ID uh, update or whatever it was. Right? And so we have two different URLs. The first one is for rendering the form, and then the second one is for actually making the update to the database. And then our URL handler for this guy, that callback, will do something in Node that is making this kind of change to our database. Right? It'll be an update operation. And we know that we're going to have that object ID because we've got this ID parameter right here, and we're going to guarantee that that ID parameter is that object ID. We're going to write our application so that it is. Yeah. But again, like I say, I think this is the weirdest uh, part of MongoDB syntax. Just make sure you get your set right. That's really the trick. Yeah. OK. So that's updating. Uh, again, there's all kinds of other cool updates that we can do. Um, check it out on the Mongo documentation, or you know that seven databases in seven weeks is pretty neat. So, okay, so delete, which I was royally screwing up earlier because I was calling it delete instead of remove, is actually really straightforward. Again, I'm going to target a particular collection, db.posts, and ignoring my notes, I'm going to have to make a correction and re-upload them. It is not db.post.delete. It is db.post.remove. And be careful here. If I call remove without a query object, I'm telling it to remove every single thing in my posts collection. That'll delete all those documents, right? So again, what I need to do is pass 
some kind of query object that will match against certain uh, documents in the collection and then only delete those, right? So for example, let's do a db.post.find. Uh, grab them all, but only give me the object ID. I can use this for a particular delete target. So I could say, um, let's delete the first one, why not? I could do db.post.delete with a JavaScript object saying, I only want to match those objects whose ID is this object ID. It's removed. <laughs> it isn't it? Is it? Is it removed? Is it really, Zach? <laughs> yes, it is. So, so let me fix that. <laughs> I don't know why Mongo. I mean, you know, it's crud. It's create, retrieve, update, and delete. And they're like right. insert, update, remove, and uh, whatever. So it's all right. So db.post.remove. Imagine I had remove here instead. I give it a JavaScript query object with uh, attributes or properties and their values that I'm matching. You say the remove command in your documentation. You just don't have it in the in the in the, in the, in the code example, it's right? Code yeah, I was just maybe just rushing through it, or I don't, you know, I had remove on the brain or delete on the brain. So there we go. I get number removed one, and now if I ask for all of those objects, I have one less. Right. And that that was way easier than it, I made it sound like the first thirty minutes of class. Right. That's it. So if I want to delete all of them db.post.remove with no parameter. Uh, oh, it does need a query. I give it an empty query, excuse me. Um, I don't remember if I mentioned that. Yep, so that is a genuine mistake. I need an empty query there. Number removed, six. There it is. I just killed all my posts. So db.posts.find. Fun is actually correct. They're all gone. Right? Deleting. If you accidentally delete, can you use that uh, ID, the unique ID, to reverse that the way you can and get? Um, if you if it's if if you've deleted it, they're gone. Um, now Mongo does um, support automatic, uh, almost like get automatic version control on your on your objects in your database. We don't have that enabled the way we we set it up. But you can actually tell it to keep track of every single copy of a change that you make to any object in your database, and it will and it will always give you a revisions. I think is what it calls them of those objects, and so you can like go back in history and grab other objects in your database or other versions of that object in your database. The way we have it set up, once you delete, they're gone. So so be careful, right, when you delete. Pause for a sec. Any questions about that? That's the basic. CRUD operations in MongoDB. Those are the four things that we absolutely need to do. We need to be able to create documents inside of a collection or create objects, retrieve them, update them, and delete them, right? Tons of other things that you can do in MongoDB that we're just not going to cover, uh, but that's what we need in order to build our application. So, and that's an uh, excellent place to get started. That is the syntax for it, the common pattern. We're using JavaScript, which means we're using JavaScript objects when we're doing retrieving, updating, and deleting, which is to say finds removes and updates, we need to specify a query object as our first parameter. That will subset the documents, filter down through a set of them, give us the ones that match that, and then let us make our changes or deletes or whatever to those documents. So. I'm going to cover one more thing before we wrap up, or two more things, I suppose, before we wrap up. It looks like we'll be right on time here. What we haven't seen so far, uh, although it came up at the beginning of class, is that we can use nested value or, uh, values inside of our database, yeah? So I talked about how in, in our last lesson, how in SQL, you have to use simple data types for values. I can't have an array of values inside of a SQL table. I can't have an object of values. I have to have a number or a string or an integer. JavaScript objects, on the other hand, I can nest, uh, I can nest arrays and I can nest objects in them. If you remember back to like five weeks ago, we were making those really complex objects that had lots of nested curly braces and arrays and things. I can do that in Mongo as well, right? So imagine that I want to have a post, so db.post.insert, and I want my posts to have an array of keywords. So I want my user to be able to tag my posts, more than one keyword. So I could say I need a title, 
I need an author. I need a uh, body. And then I want this thing, keywords. But I don't just want one keyword. I want an array of keywords. And this is just a JavaScript array. And it'll be an array of strings, like node, Mongo, and OK coders. So this is how tags work in WordPress? It would be one, it's not, no, because they use SQL, but this would be okay. a way to do it inside of, uh, but this would be a way to do it, you could do it this way inside of uh, Mongo, right? Similar, similar concept. And then I close my JavaScript object, and I close my call to, uh, to insert, and there we go. Yeah. And now I've just inserted an array of keywords. I know you guys are not hardcore SQL you know, people, but that is mind-blowing almost, because you just cannot do that in SQL. Yeah? There's no such thing as an array inside of a SQL table. It just doesn't exist. Um, and when I do db.post.find, uh, since this is the only object in there now, we'll see I get back this array of keywords. right? That array is fully supported by all of Mongo's other operations. So I, it's not just that I can insert arrays. I can now query against that array, right? What I mean is, let me insert another post here so that we can see there's a difference. So I'll say I've inserted another post, the same content, but it only has one keyword that's test, right? So I know that I have two posts, right? I want to find only those posts that have node as a keyword. How would I do that? In SQL, this would be damningly difficult. I'm going to have some kind of table that lets me do a many-to-many -many relationships between my keywords and my posts. In Mongo, I'm going to do db.posts.find, as we already know. And again, I'm just going to give it a regular JavaScript object that looks at the keywords attribute for any keyword that matches node. You can still do, like, Boolean function operate like boolean, with all this. Like, if I wanted one that had... Key, the keyword node, but not this other keyword. You can do all that, right? Uh, I believe so, because you can make way more complex operations. Uh, so instead of saying keywords node, I could provide an object here and do other things on that. So I think, yes, it's possible. The syntax gets more complex, right? But... Okay. Okay. Okay, really? Okay. So it looks like it here in RoboMongo it, it seems like very it lets you figure out how to do that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So yeah, I've never done that myself, so I could definitely have it wrong. Um, but this one let's do a reg regular expression for node, case insensitive. And again, this is just like my normal query object for anything else, except for now Mongo internally knows that I'm targeting an array and so now knows to look for any occurrence of node inside that array. Yeah? without me having to specify that it's an array that I'm looking at. Close it, and sure enough, it only finds me the one post that's got node in it, right? Or node in its keywords. I could do test instead. I could do an irregular uh, expression where I want to match for test or node, which should accomplish exactly what you're talking about there, Todd. And now, if I understand this correctly, it should give me both back, right? But that's a regular expression and it's slightly beyond the uh, uh, ability of, uh, of this class. But uh, get a sense for like how easy it is to do some weirdly, like particularly powerful stuff against database operations in Mongo. What's that? I thought four was two bars. Uh, it's a regular expression. Different, so. There's a, this, is, this thing right here is a particular regular expression syntax that means match either test or node, so. But it's different. It's not just JavaScript. It's different. It's definitely different. It's, its own. It's another language. It's actually another kind of programming language. You could think. You could say. So, but it's declarative instead of imperative. So, um, we cannot just insert arrays into our posts. We could also insert objects, right? So let's say, I want to insert, and this is a trivial, uh, totally made up example. You would never organize your database like this. But I say db.post.insert title a nested object test or whatever. Body, we already know what the body is. And then I'm going to say author. And now my author is itself going to be a JavaScript object. So I might say ID, one, name, OK coders. 
close that object, close my other object, close the call to insert. Right? And now db.post.find shows me that I've got this one uh, object in here that has a nested field or nested object for authors, right? And what I mean to say is that I just stuck an object inside of my document, inside of my collection. That would be like sticking a table inside of a table in SQL, which is not possible, right? And then, again, just like I have query support against arrays, I have full query support against this. So let's do another one of these, and I'll say that the author is Mr. T, and I can show that I've got those. Right? And now let's query for only those uh, documents inside this collection whose nested author is Mr. T. So I do db.post.find, pass it my query object. The author dot, uh, what was it? Did I, was it name? Author.name? I forget what I used. Mm, let's find out, because I forget. Control C that db.post.find, it's author.name, because it's a JavaScript object, right? So I can I can get into that by saying author.name. So I'll say db.post.find, author.name, I'm reaching in to, that, to the author object, asking for something that matches name, where it's Mr. T. And now it's uh, only going to give me back an error. Ah, Probably because I have to use uh, quotes here, like that. Dot is not legal syntax inside of a, a JavaScript attribute name, so I have to put it in quotes. Uh, we talked about that a long time ago. But that's pretty wild. That means I can search inside nested attributes inside of my document, right? So, and let's make sure that I fix that on my page here. That's powerful. That's pretty powerful. So if you're used to working with SQL or a more simple uh, system like Excel. We have set ourselves up for a mess of hurt, though. Yeah. So we have a world of trouble here. And let me just to demonstrate, let me do one more of the kind of post that we had before. db.post.insert, uh, name, Michael, Makahal, body, blah. Uh, we didn't even have it before. We, we didn't even have a name. What was the name? I don't even know. It doesn't matter, though. That's the point, right? We can do that. Title, something else, with a syntax error. There we go. And so now our db.post, if we look at our database here, I've got documents with a title, an author, a body, and an array of keywords. I have other documents with a title a body, and an author that's an object instead of a string but doesn't have any keywords. I've got another one that's got a name, whatever the hell that is, a body, and a title, right? I, each one of my objects inside of this single collection has a whole bunch of different attributes. That's a disaster, yeah, waiting to happen. There's a good reason that SQL enforces a structure to your databases. It is to prevent you from shooting yourself in the head with stuff like this. Like, this is way worse than shooting yourself in the foot. Because now, let's say I am in my application, and I say, hey, db, db.posts, find me everything, but only give me back uh, keywords. So I can pass it a second object, right? And I say, keywords, true. And it goes, okay, here you go. And the last three objects don't have any keywords, right? And in my application, if I do something in my application that depends on keywords existing on these objects and tries to use it for something, like call a method against it, that's going to crash my application. Yeah? So I have to now write application logic, sort of code in my application that checks for the existence of keywords on the objects that are returns and returned and does something in response, whether they have them or not. Yeah? And so it's really nice that I can create this document, uh, create this database without any structure very quickly and just do whatever I want. It's a disaster for later application development. We call it technical debt. I'm, I'm, I'm creating all manner of headaches for me in the future. Um, and so that is what it means, though. Like, the ability to do this is what it means when we say that Node uh, and most NoSQL, I'm sorry, Mongo and most NoSQL systems are schemaless. I do not have to define my database structure in advance when I create my collections, right? when I create my tables. And I can change the uh, kinds of data or the types or the attributes 
that I stick on my documents in any one collection. That is schemaless. Yeah. So you can't lock these Mongo databases. No. Okay. The lock happens inside of your application code. So you have to write your application so that basically all your programmers agree to only stick this kind of data in it. And then probably you write a bunch of tests that make sure nobody's doing anything stupid and putting the wrong kind of data in it. So. Yeah. Is there anything natively that's like show me? ones that don't have this value or show me mismatches within this document, or would that be something you have to write? Like your so let's think about it. So what happens if we try to grab keys, uh, or, sorry, keywords on this guy right here? It's a JavaScript object, and I, act and I access the keywords attribute. What am I going to get back? Undefined. So my guess, I actually don't know if this is true or not, that I could find every post where keywords is false or undefined. I'm sorry. So I want to show keywords. Uh, that's not what I want to do because that's my second object. I'm going to do it on my first object, my query object, right? I'm going to say keywords undefined. Is that going to show me every post that doesn't have any keywords? I actually don't know. Can't canonicalize the query. <laughs> okay, apparently I can't do that. Is there like a null or no? What about a false or a null? No, but I bet you. We expected three. No, it worked. Okay. I'm a little surprised that worked. If you look closely at the documentation, I think I've read this before, one of the advanced queries you can do is a contains operator or like a has property operator, I think, if I remember correctly, that checks for the existence of an attribute on the document. In fact, it might be exists. Well, if, if, if no works, then you can just write the query, you can just write the query and say this and or, you, know, you can exclude the ones that have the null. You should be able to do that. I think so, but I really think that you can do this. You do something like db.post.find, keywords, another embedded uh, 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 structure, dollar exists, which is like this special dollar set, and then I say true. Close that, close that, close that, and there we go. Those are the ones that have keywords. Yeah. And so this is a special kind of node, or I'm sorry, Mongo operation. Notice that I don't say what keyword I'm looking for is just a simple string. I give it an object, and I say, I'm checking for the exists factor, true. Or I could say exists, false, right? And then I can combine these things together. So I could say something like, fine, keywords exist true, name false. Name exists false, right? And you build those up into complex looking queries. But again, it, what's nice about it is it's not SQL. It still gets pretty complex. Queries are complex. But you're doing it in just these JavaScript objects. Yeah, it's just JavaScript. So, so yes, it is possible to do that. Uh, so be careful, right? We have this schemaless database system uh, that will let us very rapidly sort of build an application, test an application, kind of play with a data model. What kind of attributes do we really want to keep track of? How are we going to relate them to each other? We don't really know right now. But we can sort of play with it and test it with ourselves and find out. And then when we get to a good format, you write a little specification for yourself. And you say, these are the collections, these are the documents, these are their attributes. And then you enforce that specification in your application's code. And you just make sure that you do things the way that you say you're going to do them, without any help from the database. Any questions? Pause. Getting close. That's right. That was We nailed two hours. First time. I don't have an explicit homework assignment. We're going to have a big homework assignment on Thursday. Study this stuff, yeah? If you're still catching up, catch up. Uh, go check out the mongodb.org documentation and look through that documentation. Look through this CRUD stuff. This is really what you want to look at. CRUD and then maybe data models. That's the best place that you can get information about using MongoDB. On Thursday, we're going to learn how to incorporate this in our Node application. And then your homework assignment will be building that out. And as well, probably some practice with writing more complex queries so that you guys know how to do it. And that'll be a big part of starting, of, like I say, connecting all these pieces together, right? We know how to connect HTML and CSS with Node because we can render and we can generate static files and all that stuff. Now we're going to connect the database to Node. And then we'll have a complete view controller model layer for our application. And we'll be ready to move into the final stages of our product doing some more advanced stuff. Uh, with data manipulation in our in our in our application. So, awesome. sweet. Okay, thanks, guys. Good job.
started off rough, though. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's good. It's, uh, I was like, will we be able to pull it together? 